Hello, Rachel. Hello, Abbott Gregory. How are you? Very well, thanks. How are you? And there's Jacob. Wonderful. We're all here together. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Blessed Feast of St. Benedict to all of you. And on behalf of Paraclete Press, welcome to our conversation today with Abbot Primate Gregory Pollen and author Jacob Raya. My name is Rachel McKendry. I'm the publicist here at Paraclete. Thank you so much for joining us. So really today, happy to be with you. Thank we're going to be discussing a particular aspect <laughs> of Benedictine life and spirituality, which is the divine office. We have a wonderful audience, including many of our Benedictine brothers and sisters and oblates from around the world, which is fantastic. So wonderful, Abbot Gregory, that you're right here in the U.S. with us today. Yes. <laughs> wonderful. We're just so, so happy to have you here. Thank you. Happy to be with you. I'm going to ask all our attendees to take a moment to find the chat bar or the Q&A button or the option to raise your hand. Um, we really do want this to be a conversation. So if you have thoughts or questions, especially later on in the hour, we hope you'll join right in. So just a very quick word of introduction about our guest today. Father Abbot Gregory J. Pollen, OSB, serves as Abbot Primate of the Benedictine Order. Previously, he led Conception Abbey for 20 years as its abbot and served as president rector of Conception Seminary College for 10 years prior. A scholar in scripture and theology, Abbot Gregory has been prominent in the field of biblical translation. I've had the privilege of hearing Abbot Gregory a few times at our own monastic community, the Community of Jesus here on Cape Cod. So it's, it's just such an honor to have you with us today, Abbot Gregory. Really happy to be with you. Thank you. And our author, Jacob Raya, is a Benedictine oblate, translator, teacher, and poet, and author of the new released St. Benedict Prayer Book, which we'll talk about more later today, too. His books include translations and editions of Benedictine works from the early medieval through the modern periods, as well as his own poetry collection, Sunk in Your Shipwreck. Jacob lives on Milwaukee's Lower East Side with his wife and three children. So again, thank you so much for all of you joining us. Abbot Gregory and Jacob, um, I would love to start by introducing our audience to the idea of the divine office. We obviously have a sympathetic crowd, so we may be preaching to the choir a little bit. <laughs> but the notion of the divine office is um, just so important, such a basic of Benedictine spirituality. And I'd love to just introduce people to that idea. Sure. Well, one of the things to uh, keep in mind is that the Liturgy of the Hours actually even dates the Christian era because we go back and we see how the uh, temple sacrifices uh, were uh, a way of the people offering their, their thanksgiving in the context of uh, this daily worship. And because of these Jewish roots, we then see how this began to move into uh, Christianity. And uh, we see, you know, after period, particularly the, uh, the edict, of oh, excuse the, me. <laughs> the uh, um, edict of Constantine uh, brought to cathedral offices, the opportunity for people to, to pray, what we today call the Liturgy of the Hours. Mm -hmm. And I think one of, one of the most basic things to, to keep in mind there is that it's a way of sacralizing the day, mm -hmm. of, of seeing times set aside to, in effect, stop our work and take on another work, oftentimes called uh, the work of God. Huh? And uh, so we see how this was uh, taken up by the early sources. So one that would have been similar at the time of St. Benedict called the rule of the master. He there speaks about different aspects of the liturgy of the hours. And then we see how Benedict himself takes up uh, this idea and uh, carries it forth within the context of a monastic community. I love that. Jacob and I were just talking um, about the fact that in our community, we do the Liturgy of the Hours with Gregorian chant. 
and how um, we both happen to be married with children. And people say, how do you, what, you really stop and do these services? And it, we're joking about, yeah, okay, inconvenience, but really those are the things that make the rest of life possible. Yes. <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's like a little mini retreat every few hours, you know, and that's, that's a welcome thing um, in the press of any day, I suppose, yeah. Thank you. You know, one, one of the things that I would say too in, in visiting a variety of different uh, communities throughout the world, um, the liturgy of the hours is really kind of part of a rhythm of the day mm -hmm. uh, in that, the um, time set aside for prayer, consecrate the day and whatever other work we are doing in the context of that day. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, as long a process of, of, and rhythm of life uh, that we can see from the, the earliest times in the life of the church. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, especially maybe being somebody in the world um, every day, every day, um, I think as moderns, because this, this developed in antiquity, uh, well, I, although as Father Abbott points out, even before uh, the incarnation, um, you know, the, this is developing, but you know, the full liturgy of the hours that we know develops in antiquity and develops uh, and grows in the, the medieval period. And people had much, uh, a much closer relationship to the sun and the moon and the stars and the seasons um, back then, even if they weren't in the fields, you know, like you just know electric lights, you know, you know those things. And so much of our days in the modern world, uh, in the monastery and now, we do things, we surround ourselves with walls and fake lights and all these things that, and have heat and air conditioning that make us kind of forget what's going on in the cosmos and what's going on in the earth around us. And, if you have to say morning prayer, you have to say it in the morning. You can't say it later on, right? If I sleep in until nine, right. you don't get to say lauds anymore, right? Like lauds is gone. So, oh, well, well, you know, but also the, the, the prayers tend to have themes, right? Like the morning talks about the sun rising and you know, the sun setting in the evening and then Compline talks about protecting us while we sleep and all these things. So it, it reminds us that we are part of the world too. I think that's so important about it. You know, I think one of the, the other things, too, that um, are, is an important thing to keep in mind is that it establishes a kind of rhythm to the day. And, you know, um, when we talk about the Psalms themselves, we're talking about the Psalms of other people. And so how important it is for us to be able to see how the Psalms become a kind of springboard to our own prayer. How do they inspire us? What do they say to us? How can we see that they are speaking to us in our own day, despite the fact that they are 2,500 years old? Father Abbott, I wonder if you um, might be willing to talk a little bit about even the fact that in the rule, St. Benedict sort of outlined, I mean, not sort of, he really did. Here's exactly how you're supposed to do this. Here are yeah. the psalms you need to say. Here's how often you need to say them. <laughs> Would you be willing to speak to that, those particulars a little bit? Sure. Thank you. Um, uh, you particularly in relation to our own day and age? Or, sure, yeah. You know, I think one of the things that, that we see in um, St. Benedict is uh, another rule and that rule is moderation. Mm -hmm. And so within the context of that moderation, uh, a monastic community has to be able to see how it can do, for example, its work, its life, its service of others, and within that to be able to consecrate the day. Mm -hmm. And um, as I have, you know, traveled around the world, it has been wonderful to see the variety of ways in which people have been uh, adapting what is really a classical rule of prayer to the way that they are living, in the culture that they are living, and uh, also how the office is always open to, to, uh, to be 
uh, a, a vehicle of prayer for others. Um, I remember um, three different experiences uh, when I was abbot here at Conception Abbey, and we had um, a, a very wonderful and healthy interreligious dialogue with the Jews. And uh, they would come to Conception Abbey and we would have it planned so that uh, they would be arriving there at a time when we were praying Psalms that they knew, hearing a reading from the uh, Hebrew scriptures. Uh, and they were, you know, most uh, understanding and appreciative of the fact that, uh, that we pray through Christ our Lord. But nonetheless, it was uh, a way of inviting them. And um, I think the liturgy of the hours can be uh, a wonderful device for uh, ecumenical and even interreligious dialogue and, and uh, prayer. Because, um, you know, we, we see the Psalms as the prayers really of another people, another age and another culture but there's something wonderfully classical about them mm -hmm. in that they can speak to our own day and age. Mm -hmm. And not every line, but many things. And um, you know, one of the, the questions that is always asked of me when I, when I go out uh, and speak about the Psalms is uh, the, um, the elements of some of the cursing that we, that we see within that. And how is it that you, um, that you are able to pray those? Mm. Well, you know, one thing that I have, I have said to people is that in our world today, we have so many people whose lives are so filled with sadness and suffering and misfortune that we, in a sense, become their voice before God. We can take those words and give them to God, knowing that they come from the heart of people who are struggling to find God in the midst of the, the violence, the hatred, and the war that they experience. So I, I, I always think that the liturgy of the hours are, are such a wonderful occasion. In fact, part, part of the reason that um, my, my day has been a, a bit chopped up is uh, we have an oblate weekend and we invite our oblates who are laymen and women uh, and they come to the Abbey four times a year and around the Feast of Benedict we have what we call a work and prayer weekend so they join us for all of our prayers but they also join in with working in the gardens um, on the lawns, in the church, in the sacristy. So it's, uh, it's a wonderful blend of their sharing in our own rhythm of life of, of work and prayer. I love that. I was fortunate enough to sort of grow up in the monastic tradition here at the Community of Jesus. And I remember even as a child being um, in awe of the fact that the Liturgy of the Hours was being carried on all over the world all the time. So inevitably at some time, someone was praying these Psalms and that idea of praying on behalf of those who might not be able to pray themselves or um, who were sleeping or who were working, doing something else at that time. Um, even as a kid, like I said, was just such a comfort. And I think of it still sometimes as I take my seat and open my book. Yes. It's such a privilege to be joining into that rhythm that's going on all over the place. I think um, on the on the note that Father Abbott brings up about interreligious dialogue and uh, the ecumenical dialogues, um, one one thing I want to shoot out there, especially because of this book and and just kind of things that I do in general, is um, on that very note. Let's I want to just take a moment to acknowledge and to honor the other liturgical traditions within the Church, because I'm usually when we're talking about the Divine Office in the West, we're talking about the Western Divine Office, right? The Western Liturgy of the Hours. The Latin liturgy of the hours, whether we translate it into a vernacular language or not. But you know, let's let's acknowledge and honor that the Byzantine and Armenian and Syriac and Alexandrian churches 
um, and there's many of them in the Orthodox and Catholic and, and uh, in the separated worlds from those two traditions. Um, and they go all the way back to, and they are beautiful and full things. Um, I, say, I say this especially because I think there's trends in liturgical reform communities that, that see the Latin Liturgy of the Hours and Mass as kind of being superior mm -hmm. to other traditions. And as someone who does kind of promote the Latin and Roman rites, and I do, and I love them, and they've shaped me in so many ways, it's not the right way to do it. And then there's these other things too that are okay, right? The Second Vatican Council taught, no, all of the traditions that go back are co-equally valid and authentic and beautiful in their own rights. Um, pun intended, I guess. Uh, but, uh, but you know, and, and I've actually prayed the Syrian liturgy um, because of my oblation, long story I won't go into, um, off and on throughout the years too. And I, I find treasures in that as well. So I love the Roman and Latin liturgy, but all the liturgies are the song of Christ's church to God. So I just want to put that out there quick. <laughs> Oh, I, I think uh, I think you make a, a very important point, Jacob, and uh, I would just like to um, talk uh, maybe for just a moment about um, how I think the Benedictine Confederation has made that outreach. For example, I serve as the Procurator General for the uh, Pontifical Greek College in Rome. And so it, one of my responsibilities is to find personnel to be able to, to work in these, um, these Eastern rites, which truly, as you say, uh, they are beautiful in themselves and, um, and unique in their way of, of being uh, such a vehicle of, of, of praise and thanksgiving and adoration. And uh, there is uh, uh, a wonderful beauty there. And um, I, I just heartily support exactly what you're saying. So thank you. Wonderful. Jacob, do you want to take a moment to tell us a little bit about the, this book that you've put together, our new St. Benedict prayer book? Uh, sure, sure. Um, let's see. Okay, I don't want to go on too long here, so cut me off whenever you want. Um, so I, I, had, I fell in love with dead languages a long time ago, and I don't know why, but I did. Um, and as I was going back to, I, I took a long time off after high school and started going to college, and um, it was right around the time that I started coming back to the church for real, too. And so those two paths in my life kind of came together at the same moment. And, and so that's a long backstory, too. At studying the medieval period um, and especially Benedictine culture for the last 10 plus years, um, you just come across a lot of material that's sitting in manuscripts or that's sitting in really arcane scholarly editions that nobody's gonna read except for people like me who sit in these offices with all the books and you know, that's our life. Um, and, but I know, and I know some people you know, won't necessarily want to know about these prayers and understand them, but I know there are also some people who would, but most people are not going to devote the time and energy to learn how to read, you know, manuscripts from the 14th century and Latin and stuff like that. But for some reason, I've got the fixation and I've got to do it. So I thought, okay, I'm, you know, I'm going to start kind of gathering these prayers uh, over the years. And it wasn't until I found the commemorations that are, I don't know, about halfway through the book. Um, when I saw those commemorations of these, these shorter prayers that are said after the liturgy of the hours are over, right? after the divine office is over. Um, so some of them are kind of said whenever, and some of them are supposed to, I think, kind of extend the liturgy of the hours. But this is once they're done, you say these little short prayers. And when I saw those in this manuscript, I said, okay, like I feel like somebody would really like that. And I thought of one particular person, I won't name names, but I was like, yeah, like somebody I think would care that these things exist in the world, but nobody's gonna read this 15th century manuscript from Winchester. It's not gonna happen. So if I can find someone to publish these prayers, thankfully Paraclete took it on. I am so grateful for that. Um, I, I just started gathering these things together and there's a lot more material, by the way, <laughs> a lot more. So if anybody wants more, you know, tell Paraclete, I guess we can do a sequel, um, but there's so much material. But these were, I felt like th these were the, the the cream of the crop. Um, 
And again, to just have them available to whoever might want them. You know, there's a thousand years of Benedictine prayer that, you know, they haven't been just simply swept aside, but they're kind of languishing in manuscripts and scholarly editions. Um, and in some ways for good reasons, you know, that, that happened throughout the 20th century. But I think also we've lost something too. Um, and so I think just to be able to access them and to live into them a little bit, to pray them again mm -hmm. and see if they speak to us. Mm -hmm. And maybe they won't, right? Maybe, you know, this isn't the best way to pray necessarily. It's not the only way to pray, certainly. Um, but I think there could be value in them. And when I've used them and added them to my own uh, devotion to the divine office, it's, it's enriching and it just uh, brings out the luster of these prayers. And I think it's a wonderful thing. And a lot of Benedictines loved it and fought for it throughout the Middle Ages, especially when reformers would come in and be like, no, we're going to clean all this up. They'd be like, no, no, you, no, no, we're, we like those prayers. We want those prayers. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the, the kind of history of the thing. But it's separating the little offices and then commemorations and then litanies and then kind of a miscellaneous grab bag of things that I've picked up from here and there over the years. Um, and again, I'm just so grateful to Paraclete for putting this out. It's fantastic. Well, it's, you know, again, for those of us who are connected with um, churches and congregations who do this, we're lucky we can, you know, for me, hop on down the road and take my seat and take part in the worship. But if you don't, a little book like this is, is just such a handy and practical way to be able to join in that rhythm that we're, we're talking about. Um, I'm just curious and would love to hear um, Father Abbott and Jacob, what, what your experiences are of how different churches and houses do pray the Liturgy of the Hours together. I'm so familiar with ours, which again, we do Gregorian chant and a full slate of services daily. But um, like you were saying, Father Abbott, it's, it's flexible in a way, moderation. It's, it's practically arranged according to the life of the house. So um, I would just love to hear about some of the different ways you've experienced it. Sure. Well, you know, for example, if you, if you look at the way that some of the Psalms are even built, they're built in such a way that it almost looks like there would have been in the synagogue where they were prayed, that there is a little antiphon for all the people, and then a solo canter for us to be able to simply listen and take in. And for us as uh, Benedictines, we know how important that very notion of listening with the ear of the heart is, is uh, very keen. And in, in some cases, uh, I have been with communities in which in the early hours of the morning when the office of vigils is prayed, uh, it's prayed by a solo, solo cantor, um, either he or she, who would be reciting these texts in such a way that they would be a meditative reflection and would be a kind of springboard then to, to personal prayer. And it's very interesting if you read um, the document which came out after the time of the Second Vatican Council on the Liturgy of the Hours, how it talks about the experience of sacred silence, which follows the recitation of the Psalms and the readings of sacred scripture. And I think what lies deeply behind that is to realize that these serve as a kind of springboard to what is happening within our own hearts and uh, enriching our own faith experience and calling us to be part of something larger than ourselves. So for example, I, I, I would say that when I, when I recite some of these Psalms with regard to the destruction of the temple, my heart immediately goes to those parts of the world where their places of worship are now lying in ruins. And to try to feel a communion of prayer or solidarity with them to ask God's grace to continue to strengthen them and enliven them in ways in which 
these psalms are still speaking to them uh, even today. Also, it is uh, such a rich experience because we know these were psalms that were made to be sung to the variety of different ways in which they are sung. And certainly, you know, as, as your community so beautifully does the Gregorian chant and uh, really um, in a very, very inspiring way, it, it, it lifts the soul to be able to get into the words. And we know that things like psalm tones are written to be so simple so that the words come out and that the, um, somehow in the reading of those psalms, there's, there's almost something that kind of strikes the heart and draws us back in those moments of silence where um, the general instruction on the Liturgy of the Hours talks about the sacred silences that follow the Psalms and the readings. So I think it's you know, a very worthwhile thing to keep all of that in mind also. Absolutely. I have um, a few different comments coming in our, our chat bar here. Um, let's see. Sister Leota says, if you're not familiar with um, Judith Sutera's inclusive translation and daily commentary of the Lord Benedict, her daily commentary with each day's three questions is a boon for contemplation and journaling. It's not the scholastic commentary of Abbot Paul de Lott, which most of those of us who are older grew up with, she says. So speaking to that sacred silence that you're talking about, Father Abbot, and almost lexio quality that follows the songs. That's another wonderful resource that we could take advantage of, I'm sure. Yes, and I think, you know, one, one of the uh, uh, beauties and the benefits of Sister uh, Judith's work is, is that her, uh, her working on making the rule itself um, a more inclusive uh, rendering, because we know that the first rule was written for a group of men, huh? but we, we have seen how the Benedictine rule has, has many branches for men and women, and uh, uh, her, trans her translation includes that. Wonderful. William is sharing, um, he says, regarding other liturgical traditions, the Benedictine Abbey of Niederaltaich, Germany, conducts worship in both the Eastern and Western traditions. That's wonderful. You know, um, I would mention, in addition to Niederaltaich, also the monastery of Chevton, in Belgium, uh, which is a member of the Benedictine Confederation, uh, also has a very strong Eastern tradition too. Lovely. Oh, and, and this is a very timely question. Mary Slip um, says, is there a website we can use to join in the Liturgy of the Hours? Do you have any recommendations? Is there one where we can share in the Gregorian chant? Um, and I know there are many houses that do this. Um, I'll share a link too, because our own community um, has just begun live streaming our laws and vesper services. Does, Conception does too, don't they, Father Abbott? It does. It, yeah. And it, it, it especially started during the period of the pandemic. Oh, wonderful. So we'll, we'll share some links with you, Mary, for sure. Um, but I, I, I wonder too if a quick Google search would probably show you places. Um, but but we'll, we'll find some to share with you too. That's wonderful. I really would encourage anyone who has um, questions or thoughts to, to feel, feel free to use this chat bar as some are doing or the Q&A button or raise your hand and um, I'll be happy to call on you so you can share your thoughts or questions. Wonderful. Jacob, is there anything else you want to share with us about your, your particular book? Oh, the book. Yeah. Uh, let, let me say one thing quick, though, about uh, just celebrating the liturgy with other communities, if, if oh, I may. Yeah, just to follow up, especially on what Father Apple was saying about silence in particular. Um, when I, uh, this is how, you know, impactful the lit. Oh, I was just reading something. Don't use the word impactful. Okay. This is how important. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why. This is how important the liturgy can be. When I was coming back to the church and I was, I was visiting different monasteries. I was thinking about third orders like Carmelites and Franciscans and, you know, just doing that shopping around vocation. What, what, what am I going to do? Um, 
when I went to Osage Monastery, which is um, now not a monastery any longer, um, but it was with the Benedictine Sisters of Perpetual Adoration based in Clyde, Missouri, um, who are fantastic ladies, uh, look them up. When I went to Osage, it, it's kind of one of the epicenters, was one of the epicenters of interreligious dialogue in the States uh, under Sister Pascaline Koff, who's fabulous. Um, but the, the liturgy there always started with at least a half hour, if not an hour, of silent prayer. So we would, you know, say lauds at daybreak at six in the morning, but you need to sit there for an hour of absolute silence first. Um, and that, that impressed something on me um, that I had just never seen anywhere else. And again, that's not to say that, you know, we're not doing the liturgy right if we're not doing that, right? Um, but there's, you know, with all these different variations, of course, they'll speak to different people different ways. Um, but that was the, like, doing that for a few days that way. Um, it's going to Vespers it the same way, right? We're going to say Vespers at six, but at five, come here and we'll all sit in silence for an hour together before we start. It just, it, it blew me away um, how, how powerful that was. Mm -hmm. um, and what it said about what we, what, who we are, what we're doing here, and also how important the liturgy is. All these things came together um, in that. And so I became an oblate with that community, even though I live you know, 800 miles away or whatever it is. It's like, it just, it was too good, too good not to be part of that. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a great way to do it. Not the only way to do it, but um, yeah. Um, but no, uh, let's see, as far as the other book, I, I guess I would, I'll point out a couple um, just for anybody who's thinking, well, you know, what's actually in there? You know, where did you get this stuff? Um, I'll, I'll throw out a couple things. Um, the first three little offices in the book um, are to the Trinity and to the cross and to Our Lady. And those are all from this manuscript called Elfwina's Prayer Book um, from the 11th century. It was written in Winchester. I, I don't know if people know that or not, but Winchester was actually the, like the, the ground zero of monastic innovation in early England um, and then shipped into London later on. But uh, those three, they're just fantastic offices. They seem to be the earliest little offices we can find like full, full offices um, that are not actually the divine office, but are modeled on the divine office and are to be said afterward, you know, when you go back to your cell, something like that, right? And Father Cassian Folsom, I think, points out so well in the forward to the book that um, for so long, it seems when monks said, okay, I want to pray more, what do I do? Whoever they were asking just said, oh, I pray more songs. I'm like, that's it. <laughs> just keep, keep going, you know? And so then that developed into, well, how about we do that and we'll put some antiphons in there and we'll put some color because that's how we pray, right? And so these little offices developed throughout the 10th and early 11th centuries. So those three are like some of the earliest things we have mm. um, that attest to people wanting to experiment and elaborate on the Liturgy of the Hours proper. So that's why I made those three the first thing. Um, and I'm glad, again, Paraclete was able to bring those out. Um, and then also there's these little things in the back right near the end, there's these two short prayers that again, this is, this is, this is a 14th century manuscript from Bury St. Edmunds in England, which is closer to London now, because we're later in the medieval period. And there are these little things, again, somebody must have said like, well, you got more time, pray another Psalm. I don't know, uh, but, but it's a, a section of the manuscript that's for novices, right? People who are studying to become professed monks. And amid all of these other things, there's this little treatise that says, here's how to meditate and, and enter into contemplative prayer. And it's very short, but it ends with, and so once you do all these other things I've already told you, you've still got more time. Say a bunch of Psalms for the living and deceased people that you know, especially the people who have helped the monastery out. And if you can't do any of that, at least say this one Psalm and this, this little prayer and this one Psalm and this little prayer. Mm -hmm. And it's just fascinating to me. And I love this. I, I think, Rachel, you were talking about like, this is sweeping all over the world every day right? And you know people are praying this every day. It sweeps them across the globe. That to me is something. In the 14th century, there were people who were being trained to be monks, and, and they prayed these prayers. Mm -hmm. And they, like, for at least a century or two, they were using this manuscript. So there were people who were forming, I'm going to be a monk. This is what it means to be a monk. Mm -hmm. and this is, and even monasticism aside, like, this is what it means to pray as a Christian for other people. I pray psalms, and then I pray for them in a very explicit way with a collect, right? This, this, the kind of prayer that it is. Um, people actually did that, you know? There were people in the 14th century and 15th century who, who 
shape their lives on that kind of stuff. And now we can too, you know, and we can have that kind of communion across centuries and across languages. And that to me is one of the most beautiful things about the Christian tradition, the, the universality of all of it. Wonderful. We do have several questions um, coming in that I'd love to uh, ask on behalf of our audience. <laughs> Father Rudy um, says, the Psalms were made to be sung. What are your suggestions for those of us who live busily in the world to make it possible for us to sing the Psalms? One of the things I would suggest is um, what singing is intended to do is to slow us down. Because you know, we, we, we who read our own language read it very quickly. But when we sing it, it slows us down. And sometimes there can be a simple word that jumps out at us and really calls us to pray about it. Um, I think um, even being able to take some quiet time in which um, you close the door and you, you, you chant the Psalms even recto tono on one, one tone or a very simple tone with just a, a slight um, lift in the voice and, or a slight decline in the voice on a, on a major sil um, syllable. I might, I might mention um, uh, not in, as a, <laughs> an advertisement, but uh, several years ago, I was asked by um, GIA publications in Chicago to write a series of psalm tones that are very simple for people. And uh, those can be purchased through GIA publications in Chicago. And I know a number of places are using those. And they're based on the eight Gregorian modes. Mm -hmm. So you can hear the modality in them, but they're very simple. But um, it, really, it really is worthwhile to chant, even if you do it on one tone very quietly to yourself. Thank you. Eilish yeah. asks, houses seem to follow different psalms in their weekly or four week sequences. How does this happen? Okay, that's uh, uh, a good question. The church has set up um, a four week cycle in which in the course of the year, all 150 Psalms are prayed. But in that four week cycle, not all of the Psalms are prayed in a particular season. Interestingly enough, at the time of the Second Vatican Council, Pope Paul VI asked that monastic communities would pray all 150 Psalms in two weeks or in one week. For example, my own community, we pray all 150 Psalms in two weeks. And um, there has been published a book um, with a long Latin title, the Tesaros Monastice Liturgiae Horarum, Horarium, in which they provide four different sequences in which the Psalms are um, uh, suggested to be prayed. Some have a kind of thematic approach. Mm -hmm. Some have a kind of lexio continua where you just move through the Psalter in a natural way, but distinguishing Psalms that are clearly morning Psalms from evening Psalms. Um, so th there are a variety of different ways in which it's called a Psalm cursus. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, is there a psalm cursus that is particularly used at the community of Jesus? Do you know? I, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. But uh, oftentimes, um, you know, people who have studied the psalms have a good sense of what are, you know, like the, 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 the spirit of the liturgy of the hours is praise in the morning, thanksgiving in the evening. Right. And there's a movement from... Um, you'll notice how it moves from a penitential psalm and concludes with something of praise. Mm -hmm. Similarly, again, the same movement toward thanksgiving in the evening, the thanksgiving for the blessings of the day. Sounds very familiar now that you put it that way. <laughs> Thank you, Father Abbott. Here, um, 
This is a good, a good practical question from an attendee who says, for someone who has not prayed the divine office, how would you suggest we begin? Hmm. Well, there's, there's no better way than throwing yourself into it. But I think the experience of going to a monastic community that prays the Liturgy of the Hours can really be a wonderful experience. Um, uh, whenever I'm with a, a monastic community, I'm always so happy to pray with the community because there's, there, there's a dynamic there that, that really touches the heart of a community at prayer. And I think from that, we can learn a lot about how we can take that spirit and bring it into our own private prayer if we're praying within the context of our own home. Also, I mean, this, this may be even too, too basic, I don't know, but um, either, if, you're, if you're going to be using like the Roman rite approved in the Catholic church um, to, to use the Liturgy of the Hours at home, which I know people who are not Catholic who do use that just because it's one very clear, you know, whatever. Um, so it's an authoritative edition. Um, the, the full version is four volumes long and, it, and it's very intimidating if you're not used to it, admittedly, right? Um, but just so you know, if you have seen that, if anybody has seen that and gone, whoa, that seems like a lot. There is a one volume version called Christian Prayer, which is still the full, uh, if I'm remembering right, it's full lauds and vespers, morning prayer and evening prayer. And then the other hours are reduced to make it one volume. So it's just, you don't have to go from book to book. There's less flipping of pages, um, you know, from one section of the book to another. So Christian prayer, um, as the, if you like, if you typed in Christian prayer liturgy of the hours, yeah, I'm sure you would find it very easily in Google or Amazon or whatever. Um, but that I, I started with that too. I, I took one look at the four volume thing, and well, a, it was expensive, but also wow, I don't think I can handle that. And that I used that for probably two or three years before I said no, I'd like the full offices and. Um, and I invested in the four volume finally, but the, the one volume is much less intimidating, though it's still, you know, it's still effort, right, to, to, to get into it and, and to teach yourself. So I think Father Abbott's right. If you can go somewhere where people are performing it together and say, you know, go up to somebody afterward and say, okay, how do you do this? You know, and, and even like have the book with you. How do you do this? That's, I, I taught it to myself and it took a long time. And, um, and I was very, I persevered and I like languages and I like reading and I like challenges. So like it worked out for me, but yeah, having somebody else who knows what they're doing to show you is, is definitely a good option <laughs> if you're discouraged. Uh, it might be interesting to just mention that the uh, whole of the Liturgy of the Hours is in a process of revision right now through the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Um, and that should be coming out in 2024 or 2025. So if you're going, if you're, if you're new at this and you want to make an investment, I think uh, Jacob has an important point to say there. S start slow, start simple with, with the first volume. And, you know, um, I know people that simply take one psalm a day, you know, in terms, I should say one psalm in office, and move to the reading and, and, and go through. Um, the Liturgy of the Hours is something very flexible in, in many ways, and it provides a, a, a beautiful flexibility. The important thing is communion with God in that. You know, uh, Benedict says, you know, listen with the ear of your heart and, and let those words speak to you. And sometimes, a word will just come at you and give it time to, to reflect. What is it saying? What does it mean? Why, is it, why did it strike me in this particular way? Um, communion with God is, is the heart of what it's about. Here's a question from Joel Rippinger. He says, speaking as an oblate director, I would like to have either Abbot Gregory or Jacob speak to the importance of the office of vigils. I have found that many oblates claim this as a pearl of great price for the entire divine office. Well, the office of vigils is where you find a greater concentration of Psalms, oftentimes 
two nocturnes of psalms that can mean either three psalms plus three psalms or one psalm divided if it's long into three sections. But then also it has two readings, one from scripture and the second, which is a commentary on that scriptural passage or in some way reflects uh, what that reading is. And um, the vigils um, has a special uh, kind of character to it. It's, it's, it really begins the day. Uh, you know, every time we pray, oh, uh, oh Lord, oh God, come to my assistance. But there we pray, oh Lord, open my lips as I begin this day. Um, I think that um, being able to um, take those, uh, those Psalms uh, particularly and to be able to connect them with the, um, the readings you hear, oh, it's just a, a confluence of, of, of beautiful images. And you know, that's one of the things that I think is so important in praying the Psalms and in hearing the scriptures and the writings of, of, of great um, holy people through the, through the ages is allowing, allowing their wisdom to speak to us to enhance our own personal wisdom uh, in our in our common search for God. And special greetings to Father Joel Rippinger, who I know so well. Thank you. Yeah, well, and I'll, I'll throw, as, as a layman, I'll throw something out there too, from, from my perspective. I, I also think that hearing from the church fathers um, and even like some councils and things are in, you know, the standard Roman rite um, version now, it, it's, it's such great teaching and especially to read it every year, right? And come back to these things. That's one of the great virtues of the Liturgy of the Hours of Divine Office in general, I think, right? Is to come back to them year after year. Um, but, but especially those, those readings um, during that, well, what's, office, what's the Office of Readings in the you know, standard one, but also Vigil is the traditional name. Um, to, to have those teachings kind of getting a little deeper, describing things, how things connect a little more deeply and really giving you, you know, some like the theology, but not academic theology, right? It's, it's patristic theology. So it's, it's more heart centered. It's more focused on just like get to God, get to God, you know, like that's, that's what those readings are about. And so, yeah, I find them immensely helpful as somebody who hasn't studied theology and, and you know, had to do those things um, and doesn't preach, right? Um, monks who preach probably have a different relationship with those things. Um, but I don't, I don't ever have to study the scriptures in that way. And for those readings to help me out um, to understand the, the, the liturgical year too, not just the scriptures that are being commented on um, is really, really helpful. But also throw in one real quick thing to, to encourage folks, if you are getting discouraged in your recitation of the divine office, maybe it's not for everyone. It's the church's prayer. So I, you know, in one way, I can't say that, but I would say, um, you know, when people have asked me, well, okay, so you like this thing, right? Like, okay, like, let's, let's do it once. And, I, and then I'll, I'll experience this once with you, you know, like, and, and very faithful Christians. And they'll do it once and go, okay, I can see why you'd like that, but that's not for me. No, no way. And like, again, I, in, in all charity, I say, okay, you know, spirit's not moving you to, to enter into that. I'm, I, that's not for me to say, but I would also say that the liturgy of the hours really isn't a one-off thing, you know? Um, like we've been saying here, if, if, you, if you enter into the day starting early and ending late, and you set aside these times for prayer throughout the day, and then you do that all week long, and then you do it all month long, and then you do it all year long, and then you see that yearly cycle start to happen. That's when it gets really, really just mind blowing that how the thing works, you know, and that we've done that, you know, that the church has set that thing up over centuries and centuries. Um, I would say not until, you know, anecdotally year six or seven that I was doing this, I start seeing like the real shape of the thing and go, yeah, like this is permeating my life now. And it's so beautiful, you know, it can it can be great right away for sure but there's you know usually because it is a discipline too you know it, it can get discouraging at times i think especially if, if you're not in a community that's really urging you yep got to come back to the choir now um so if you're if you're in your house alone 
it can be tough to keep it going, but my God, is it worth it? I will attest to that at least. You know, it's it's worth it to keep going. Thank you. Here's a um, a question from Wendy Cabell who says she's wondering: Are there any liturgy of the hours verses or hymns composed by women, especially in more ancient times? And if so, what sources can they be found in? I know that. Um some of the hymns of Hildegard of Bingen uh, have been a, a source of prayer, particularly for, for women. Um, unfortunately, that's, um, that's pretty much what I know. Although I can say too, I know that the nuns at Stanbrook in England have worked on a series of, of uh, prayers for the liturgy of the, or hymns, I should say, for the, the liturgy of the hours. Um, and I think that though a lot of those build on the ideas of what the hours of the office are about, the morning as you begin the day, within the context of the day, focusing your work again with God, coming to the end of the day. Um, the, the sisters, at, the nuns at Stanbrook have, have done a beautiful job on their liturgy of the hours. Okay. And they publish the hymns. Yeah, I'll second that. But I, also I think one thing to keep in mind with um, the traditional hymns, there, there are some that certainly are by authors that we know and you know they were renowned hymnologists and all these things. Um, but so many of them are anonymous. You know, so many things in the liturgy are anonymous. And so it, it's hard to know who wrote them at all. More men were certainly writing, you know, in the Middle Ages. I mean, that, that's just the reality of it. But women were writing too, you know, they, they were. So it's not un, impossible, you know, that some of the traditional hymns that we have are by women, but it's hard to know for a lot of them, you know, just where they came from. So. I think we, we often just assume if it was written in the Middle Ages, it was by a man. But there certainly were, I mean, Hildegard is our great example of, yes. like, whoa, <laughs> she was really writing. Um, but there were plenty of women writing things, you know. So it's possible that some of the hymns that we know were written by women. But again, some, some we know were written by men. But yeah, it is actually hard to think of traditional liturgy that, that was written specifically by a named woman. I'll admit, I don't have anything off the top of my head. Sister Leota is uh, recommending that the Benedictine sisters in Colorado Springs, she said perhaps Bennett Hill, have a collection of Hildegard's hymns. So Wendy, it, that might be a resource that you might wanna look at. Thanks, Sister Leota. Sister Leota is also um, mentioning for everyone that she says the four volume Liturgy of the Hours with Rome's permission can be found on I Breviary on the Apple App Store and Google Play, and it's a work of the Franciscans in the Holy Land. The wonders of technology, <laughs> adaptable to modern life. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Sister Leota. Father Rudy has another question. He's asking about, um, he says, can you illustrate about the use of the vernacular versus the Latin forms of the Liturgy of the Hours and how we secular people can benefit from either or both forms? Well, my own experience is that um, if you are um, a Latinist, you can benefit greatly um, from that. But uh, for, for the vast majority of us, and even myself who's had five years of Latin, I, I still struggle, but I, I do pray Vespers every evening in, in Latin at Sant'Anselmo in Rome. Um, but, um, those, the, the hymns for the Liturgy of the Hours are to speak to the hours of the day in which they are being um, celebrated. So the, the morning talks about uh, the beautiful uh, uh, sun coming up and, uh, and bringing light to the world and how Christ can enlighten that world. The end of the day we bring our own thanksgiving uh, to join with the thanksgiving of the world for, for the blessings of the day. 
So a lot of times the hymns are intended to be able to bring across those themes. Thank you. I, I would say as a, as a translator, um, I think it's, it's very much like translation in general, in, in some ways. Um, I mean, there might be theological ramifications we could pontificate on, but in a general way, um, you know, to, especially with the hymns, you know, if you know, or in the Psalms, if you know Latin and you can read it um, and actually understand it somewhat, at least real time, I think it is fantastic to be able to do because, you know, if, if you read Dante in English, you know, it, it can be transportational. It can be fantastic, but it's not, you know, it's still not reading Dante in Italian. It's just not, right? Um, but it doesn't mean that it's not good in the English version. So, you know, the Latin hymns, they, they do have their own kind of Latin poetic beauty. But, you know, can you still get something of that across in a translation? I think we can, or none of us would translate stuff, you know, like it, there just wouldn't be a reason to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I don't know. I, th I think uh, if, you, if you aren't familiar with Latin, beating yourself over the head to try um, on your own would, would be tough, but maybe some people would like it. I don't know. Um, but I think the English translations are, are good for the most part, right? I guess we're getting a new one anyway, but um, you know, I, 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 I love Latin. I read Latin, I study Latin, but I don't think that it's intrinsically more holy or anything like that. You know, it's, it's a beautiful language, but so is English. And so is Spanish, and so is French, and on and on, right? You know, to, to uh, build on what Jacob is saying there, uh, just so that people know, when the first edition of the Liturgy of the Hours was put out, um, there was a rush to be able to get it. Um, and they drew hymns from a variety of different places. And they um, have some relation to the, um, to the hour that's being celebrated. But now this forthcoming edition, the hymns are translated from the ancient Latin. And um, I think they have a, a better sense of our movement through the day and how that hymn focuses us on that particular hour. Thank you. Well, here's an interesting question um, from Sharon. She says, could you speak to us about how the saints, like St. Joseph, can intercede for us as we commit to the divine office? I have asked St. Joseph to help me with silence and listening. And she also notes that St. Joseph must have also prayed the Psalms. To be sure. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the Psalms were the prayers of Jesus, and obviously the Psalms were the prayers of his parents. And um, I think it's a question of praying them and being comfortable with some of the images that we find there. And what, what do those images say to us? Because images are intended to be a kind of springboard to our, our own inner reflection. And our ability to use those images as uh, a way to pray can be a, a very helpful way to make uh, the Psalms uh, a special prayer book for us. Thank you. And also, I think, um, it's certainly, I love the, the, the um, ideas about St. Joseph there, but really, I mean, all the saints, <laughs> practically, until at least at like the 17th century, were being shaped by the Liturgy of the Hours. You know, sometimes from the time they were six or seven years old, Zoblets, right? Um, like you, you can't escape the divine office in the middle ages uh, <laughs> you know if you were in the church you know quote unquote so uh, you know like yeah if you actually go back and read i mean read saint peter damien on the liturgy read um i don't know the list goes on and on whatever i won't go on and on here but yeah i mean the, and, and that's kind of gets back to what i was speaking to before it's it's all over the world right now but it's also down the ages people have been doing this for so long and, and you get to enter into that stream when you really enter into the divine office. And there's a lot of good company there. Mm -hmm. It's interesting um, because, you know, so many monastic houses, it's, I think they've become more and more popular, but it's not exactly, um, it's a destination, let's put it that way. And I think about, um, you know, particularly contemplative houses. Um, it's a work that goes on within the house, but, um, 
Rachel Srubis is, um, she's, a, she's an, an author of ours. Hi, Rachel, nice to see you. Um, she's an oblate and um, she's asking, how has the increase of live streaming perhaps expanded the reach of Benedictine communities into the world? And how perhaps is the Liturgy of the Hours connecting people in new or unexpected ways? And I, I just find, um, you know, we, we joke about the blessings of the pandemic. Yes. <laughs> but this is certainly one that I don't know if any of us would have ever anticipated. I know that, uh, you know, with our live streaming at Conception Abbey, I'm amazed at the number of people who are daily praying with us and um, keeping a copy of the Psalter at hand and um, knowing how we move through the Psalter particularly and um, finding that to be um, a real balm for their spirit in, in the midst of, of this pandemic. Wonderful. There's a lot of discussion about the, the four volumes, and I don't know much about that. So <laughs> I'll, I'll, trust, um, I'll trust the recommendations that are be, being given here, especially Sister Leota's resources that she's recommending. Um, there's a question that Elizabeth is asking about parishes and the Liturgy of the Hours. Um, we have sort of a, a Gregorian specialist, Gregorian chant specialist here at Paraclete, Jim Jordan, who Elizabeth, I'll be happy to put you in touch with him because if you're interested in resources for your parish, I think that um, he would be someone at Paraclete who could help you out. I don't know, Abbott, Gregory, or Jacob, if you have anything to recommend to Elizabeth. You know, um, uh, I, I just uh, received a, a, a little memo from Sister Ann Shepherd in Atchison. And one of their sisters who is a, a superb scripture scholar, Sister uh, Mary Irene Noel, has published a book, I believe um, through a liturgical press. It's called um, a Praying, Cursing and Singing. And it's, it's, it's a, a way of entering into the, uh, the Psalms. It's, Pleading, cursing, praising, conversing with God. And that's by Sister Irene Noel, and it's spelled N-O-W-E-L-L. -L. She's a, a, both a, a top biblical scholar and also uh, someone who uh, clearly loves this, the Psalter so well. Wonderful. I'm trying to type that into our chat bar here so that everyone can see it. A highly recommended volume. Wonderful. Well, I'm noticing that we are really um, past the end of our hour. I apologize. I had a feeling this conversation could go on and on, and here we are. But uh, um, really, just thank you so much, Father Abbott, Gregory. Thank you so much, Jacob. Thank you to all of you who joined us. Thank you for all your questions. Um, I just, well, a quick note that in celebration of tomorrow's feast, we're extending a special offer on all of our Benedictine resources from Paraclete, including Jacob's beautiful new book. I just love this cover. It's so vibrant. I look forward to it in every way. As you we did, a, we did a great job on the cover. Great job on the cover. I love the Raven. A little bit of Benedictine, Benedict storytelling right on the cover there. So if you, um, if you choose to order from Paraclete, just use the coupon code Benedict when you check out and um, you'll get 15% off. And for those of you who are Gregorian chant enthusiasts, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that we're also having a summer special running on all of our chant books. We distribute the Gregorian chant books from Salem and our own Paraclete books um, and recordings too. You know, if you can't get your hands on a book and play the office, there are, there are lovely recordings of um, houses around the world chanting the offices. And so we happen to carry um, several from Salem, which are a, a, a just lovely to have. So um, you might wanna take advantage of that too. And of course, we always first encourage you to visit your local bookseller, perhaps at your, your church or local abbey too, who I'm sure carries wonderful resources. So um, if, if you're looking for something we have at Paraclete and your bookstore doesn't carry it, just have them get in touch with us. So many more comments still coming in. Apologies, everyone, for those I didn't get to. I'm going to try to copy the chat so I can make sure <laughs> 
that I don't miss anything. So thank you again, Abbot Gregory. Thank you, Jacob. Our continued prayers with all of you around the world for health and safety during these times. And uh, we hope to be able to talk again soon. Thank, thank you, you so Rachel. Much. Thank you so much for moderating our session together. Uh, a real joy to be with you. Really a privilege. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yep. Take thank care, you, everyone. Thank you, Brother Abbott. Okay. You too, Jacob. Thank you so much. Happy to meet you on even if yes. it's online, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> likewise, likewise. <laughs> Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. God bless. Bye now. Bye.